Hello and welcome to the next part of the session. In this part we will study about the most important a vital organ of our circulatory system that we call as the human heart. So in this topic we will discuss all the things that are related to our human heart. First we will start about the location of the human heart, then we will discuss about the coverings of the human heart, then we will start with the coverings of the heart wall and after that we will discuss the external structure, the internal structure, all the valves and the concerned blood vessels attached to it. So first before discussing all these things let us give a brief introduction about this very important, the very uh, fascinating organ that, that, uh, that does not actually stop working from the birth to the death that is this very vital important organ we call as the human heart. So this is the diagram of the human heart. You can see that this is uh, a very, it seems to be a very complex uh, structure. Like it has some blood vessels, there are some muscular structures, there are some veins, there are some fatty depositions. All these things we will discuss what actually they are in detail. So first we will say that what is exactly this human heart? and we define it in a shorter terms we define it as it's a mesodermally derived muscular pumping organ so what does this mean actually so when we come to this part that is mesodermally derived so it means that since we know that we humans are triploblastic animals and at the time of gastrulation during the embryonic development at the time of gastrulation three germ layers are being formed Okay, the first germ layer that we call as ectoderm, then we have the middle germ layer that we call as a mesoderm and we have the internal germ layer or the inner germ layer that we call as endoderm. So out of the three, these three layers, we say these three layers participate in formation of different organs and all and out of these three layers, we have the middle layer that we call as actually mesoderm. This mesoderm actually participates in the formation of this beautiful organ that we call as heart. So we can say that the heart is derived from the mesoderm layer during the embryonic development. Okay. Next, if we will say that we said that it is a muscular organ. Muscular organ means that it is the heart only that does not have a bone. Okay. So, we say that actually inside the heart there are specialized muscles that we call as cardiac muscles. So, we say it is specifically made up of cardiac muscles. In class 11, when we uh, discuss the unit human physiology then we have one of the chapter in it that we call as skeletal system locomotion and movement. So we discuss about different types of muscles there and there we mentioned that there are three types of muscles in a human body. One is we call as the smooth muscle then we have the skeletal muscle and then we have the cardiac muscle and when we explain the cardiac muscle we say that this cardiac muscle is restricted only to that of our heart. It means that cardiac muscle is present only in the the heart rest in no other portion of the body this muscle can be observed or this can be found okay let's give a little bit characteristics of this cardiac muscle a shorter uh, group we will say a shorter uh, detailed structure of this cardiac muscle the, it, the characteristic features you must have studied but a short review we will can say that it has intercalated discs it has some of the features that resembles to the, that of smooth muscles and some of the features that resembles to that of skeletal muscles okay and one most important thing is that these muscles don't work under our will that is why we we call them as involuntary in nature okay and we said that this is a pumping organ this entire structure is a pumping organ okay we can say how because if you will observe that there are different blood vessels attached to it you can see it here only 
so what these blood vessel why these blood vessels are attached to it it means that these blood vessels are going to collect the blood from different parts of the body and then maybe these blood vessels are giving out the blood to different parts of the body collection of blood and giving it back that is actually the function of this heart that is why we call it as a pumping organ because it's going to pump blood from the farthest parts of the body and collecting the blood and giving it back that is actually we call as the pumping activity of the human heart okay so if we will say that approximately in a day we can say 2000 gallons of blood 2000 gallons of blood are pumped per day okay so we can say now let's give a quick review that the human heart is derived from the mesodermal layer of the embryo or the, during the gastrulation second we can say that this is a muscular organ and the specific muscles that are present here are called as cardiac muscles the most important fact about them is that these muscles never get fatigue and the very important thing is that they are involuntary in nature they don't work under our will second we said uh, say, uh, said that that it is a pumping organ pumping organ means it's going to pump the blood and we may be sometimes ask that how many gallons of blood are uh, pumped per day and the answer for that is approximately 2000 gallons of blood are pumped by our human heart per day so this is the first introduction about the heart now we will say that if it's a very fascinating organ so we have to understand that where actually this heart is present okay you will get this diagram and this diagram is particularly focused I'm not going to discuss the parts in detail I'm just trying to explain you out that where actually this heart is located and where we will understand the location of the human heart that we will take an x-ray film and we will observe that whether this part how does this part appears in the x-ray film okay so we will see that this is entire region you can observe these are the lungs these are the ribs and downwards there's a diaphragm and you observe that there's a white shaded region entirely white marked region from here this along okay let me make an outline for it so this entire structure is I call as meristinum this is the meristinum what is exactly meristinum we will understand that we say that the human heart is located in which cavity it's located in the thoracic cavity you know thoracic cavity in simpler words we can say also as chest region what we can call it as in simpler words we can call it as a chest region okay okay a short bit information about the body is divided into how many cavities let's give a little bit idea about at the top we have this cranial cavity then at the neck we have the cervical cavity little bit like this let's get a fast review about this thing so this is we call as cranial cavity cranial cavity this is we call as the neck region we call as cervical cavity then we have the chest region that we call as thoracic cavity and then we have the next region that we call as actually abdominal cavity so where we are concerned about we are concerned about this cavity that is we call as thoracic cavity so in this thoracic cavity we also called as chest region the heart is present okay but in the thoracic cavity there are different organs there is not only heart there are different couple of organs are there and we will see where exactly this heart is located so this is our heart you can see like this all thing is our heart this diagram this entire structure is the heart you are observing that this this heart is located between the lungs this is the lung first this is we can say left lung this is the right lung okay in between the two lungs the heart is located and it means that the lungs are providing a sort of space okay the two lungs are actually providing a sort of space and in this space the heart is actually fitted on or we can say the heart is located in this region the two spaces that the lungs are provided and this space is we call as meristinum 
So, we can say the heart is located in the mediastinum. Mediastinum actually is just a space. We can say it is an entire space or it is a hollow space that is present between the lungs and that can actually give a proper space, give a proper encorement for the heart to, be, uh, to get fitted or to get, uh, to get a proper location. Okay. So, next if we will see that if we have an x-ray film with us, you know sometimes when we feel a little bit like suffocation, we feel uh, some symptoms of heaviness, we, uh, we feel like uh, most oftenly uh, these days people are feeling uh, facing these symptoms like uh, the, we get a pain in the left uh, arm first then this pain radiates to our left side of the body and suddenly we feel heaviness and all that. So when you report these type of symptoms to a doctor, the doctor must tell you about he must say you that uh, you must go for an x-ray film okay so uh, how you locate this mediastinum in x-ray film actually we are concerned about that, this thing so if we take a back sides we are just dis displaying this uh, just an uh, image of x-ray film so in the x-ray film when you see that there is a central region i am just highlighting it here only this thing so this region is we call as this region is actually unshaded you can see that there are some on the uh, on this and that side there are darker regions on the right left side of the lung on the right side of the lung there are entirely dark regions but in between there is a light shaded region and this light shaded region is we call as meristinum okay so in the x-ray film you will see that the meristinum is actually a light shaded part way which actually defines the location of the heart okay next if we will say that we discussed that the heart is located in the mediastinum. Mediastinum is just a space between the lungs. Okay. Now, if I will say that, I will just draw a diagram a little bit here, defining actually the shape of the heart. Okay. So, we say generally it is a little bit conical in shape. Okay. And second, when we say about the size and all these things, I guess this is quite clear. We say that the adult, the uh, the size, uh, or we can say the size of the human heart looks like an adult fist. If we close our fist, then this becomes the size of the human heart. And about the shape, if we are concerned, then we will actually discuss the shape under two segments. Okay, we say that the human heart is actually divided into two parts. Okay. This we will call as a superior portion. We are concerned about the shape. Okay. This is the superior part and this one we can say as this one entirely whole this part. This is we call as this part is called as inferior side. Inferior side. Okay. This is the superior side and this is the inferior side. If you compare the diameter here, you can say at the top it's little bit broad, okay. And this top end that is actually broad, we call it as base. What we call it as base. And the lower end we will say that it's quite narrow. It's quite narrow, and that end we call as actually apex. What we call it as apex, okay. So if you will see that here only even in the last segment if you if you might have carefully observed then in the x-ray film it was quite clear that this lighter region is more towards the left lung okay please let me write it left lung and this is the right lung so you are observing that the lighter region is more towards the left lung lighter region we are seeing more towards the left lung why this because the reason is that the apex of the heart, the apex of the heart is actually tilted towards the left. It is tilted towards the left, towards the left. Okay. Why it is tilted towards the left? Why it is not tilted towards the right? The common reason for this is in the left side of the lung, we can say in the left lung probably, there is actually an inward bend. I can say, let me assume this is a lung and this side and on the front side of the lung, we can say there is a little bit concavity. Okay. Let me assume. 
this is a lung okay this is a lung with it so this is the free surface of the lung i am observing that there is actually a concavity there is a concavity there is a bend and this bend and the apex of the heart is going to get fitted in this bend this is the left lung this is the bend and this bent region is we call as cardiac notch what we call it as cardiac notch and in this bend the apex of the heart can get fitted on the apex of the heart can get fitted on and in this way we will assure that the location the heart is placed in a stabilized position okay so we can say that the apex of the heart is tilted towards the left side reason is that because in the left lung there is an inward bend that bend we call as cardiac notch and that cardiac notch actually helps in the accommodation of the heart okay so if we will see that this is actually the left lung this is the right lung okay in this is the uh, mediastinum and this bay this part is we call as apex you can look it here and the upper side this is we call as the base and there are different blood vessels attached to it like the this is we call as period vena cava this is we call as aorta this this is the pulmonary trunk that is going out we will go, uh, discuss all these things in detail so just there is we are in this uh, diagram we are just focused about the position of the heart it's present between the lungs and on the uh, second thing we can say it's above the diaphragm and all these things okay so next point we will say that where we were, we are now clear with the location of the heart and now we will discuss about since heart is internally the nature has actually designed the our body in such a system that all the vital or the delicate organs are present inside the body okay and inside the body in order to uh, uh, give them a sort of confirm protection there are special coverings to it like we'd say that in the last lectures we have must have studied like in the lungs there is also protective covering on the kidneys there are also protective coverings and same ways our heart is also a delicate organ and it needs some sort of protective coverings around it okay so how we will understand these coverings it's quite a simple thing you just assume that we have a poly bag and in that poly bag we are putting a cotton swab okay so we will assume that actually this heart is protected in a sac like structure or in a bag like structure and that bag like structure we call as pericardium okay please come to the diagram here only if this is the heart this is the heart okay this is the apex this is the base and all these things we can say this entire heart is covered in a sac like structure and this sac like structure is we call as pericardium okay so we can say the heart is protected by a very double membrane uh, like double membrane bag like structure that we call as pericardium okay so the outer protective covering is called as pericardium clear and now we added a point to it we said it's a double membrane so we will come clearly to the point that this pericardium is actually divided into two parts okay one is we call as fibrous pericardium okay and the next is we call as serous pericardium serous pericardium okay so for fibrous pericardium we don't have further uh, divisions but in serous pericardium we have again how many divisions we have two divisions okay the first division is we call as parietal pericardium and the second is we call as visceral pericardium okay so now we can call this visceral pericardium also as epicardium please remember it's a very important point you will repeat this word again in the layers of the heart that is this epicardium 
okay we said pericardium is a double membrane like structure it's bifurcated into two parts the outer part we call as serous pericardium and the next part is we call as uh, sorry fibrous pericardium is the outer and the next we call as serous pericardium then again we said that the serous pericardium is further bifurcated into two parts one is the parietal pericardium and the second is the visceral pericardium okay and we said that the visceral pericardium is actually the second name for visceral pericardium is also called as epicardium why i am highlighting on epicardium because when we will go for the next slide of this presentation we will observe that there would be actually we will discuss the topic about the heart wall layers and among the heart wall layers there are three heart wall layers and we say that the innermost layer is actually we call as epicardium okay so remember this thing now if we will see that this parietal pericardium and visceral pericardium okay they are actually separated by a space they are separated by a space so i will uh, just list it here parietal pericardium okay and visceral pericardium okay they are separated by a space that space we call as pericardial cavity pericardial cavity okay and in this space there is a specialized fluid that we call as pericardial fluid okay so what is the function of this pericardial fluid and what is the function of this cavity actually since we are saying that cavity it means there is a space in between okay the space is separating the pericardial we can say pericardial uh, cavity uh, perica parietal pericardium with respect to visceral pericardium okay so in between the space we said that there is a fluid that we call as pericardial fluid and what is the function of this fluid that is often asked okay so as it's a fluid so we can say like in other parts we were discussing the same point is also here that it will act as a lubricant what it will act as it will act as the fluid will act as a lubricant lubricant okay okay so uh, what do you mean by lubricant actually i am saying that these are the two layers okay let's assume that these are the two layers this is the parietal pericardium this is the visceral pericardium so when the heart is contracting if it if the gap would not be there if the fluid would not be there when on during contraction these two layers will start will slide over each other and due to continuous sliding what could what can what could be the chances that there must be maximum chances of wear and tear okay the two layers can get damaged okay in order to avoid this wear and tear or in order to avoid this friction or in order to avoid this any sort of uh, uh, we can say defect so we we have a very important fluid filled inside that actually provides lubrication so that these two layers can equally slide over each other without any sort of damage okay and second we can say that this layer is actually protecting the heart okay it is actually it acts as a shock absorbent what it acts as it acts as a shock absorbent and even we can say that it protects the heart from any mechanical damage these are the functions of this thing okay even let's come to here only so we said that pericardium is actually you can observe it here now this is we call as parietal pericardium and this is we call as visceral pericardium in between the parietal and visceral pericardium we have actually this thing that we call as peri uh, uh, pericardial cavity you can observe it here this cavity and in this cavity there is actually a fluid we call it as pericardial fluid okay and moreover if we will see that what happens this is the outer fibrous pericardium okay then fibrous pericardium uh, has inner one thing this is the fibrous pericardium second in the diagram it's not clear so i wrote it back sides only so again i am repeating it here in the this is the first that is we call as the pericardium is divided into two layers fibrous pericardium then we have the next part that we call as serous pericardium in the serous pericardium we have further off how many layers we said that 
in the serous pericardium we have two layers that was a parietal pericardium that was a visceral pericardium we also call visceral pericardium as epicardium it's clearly written here only so next we said that the two layers are separated by pericardial cavity and in between the two cavity in between this cavity we have or in the inside this cavity we can say there is a fluid that acts as a shock absorbent that protects the heart from mechanical damage and that actually gives a sort of lubrication to the two membranes okay now there is a, a one thing that we can uh, come to know about this very important term we call it as pericarditis okay what happens you know whenever you see in the zoo part when you see itis at the last you can guess that this is this is a term related to the inflammation so if somehow due to any viral attack due to any uh, we can say pathogenic attack if and all what happens these pericardial membrane this pericardium actually swells it shows redness a sense of pain that actually we call as inflammation if and all these things are reported in the pericardium we call we give a term to it we call as pericardites okay so what is pericardites it is actually the inflammation of the pericardium due to anything due to any attack whether it's a microbial attack it's a pathogenic attack and all the mechanical attack and all these things okay so next thing if we will discuss about now we have the next slide that we will in this we will discuss about how the how what are actually the things that make up the heart wall okay so this heart wall is actually composed of you can see here it's the diagram of a human heart okay so we have just taken a small cross section of this okay in this cross section we will discuss the entire layers along with these heart walls okay so again if i repeat this is the fibrous pericardium this thing is now clear again then this is the second pe uh, part of the pericardium that is serous pericardium these things are clear to you now i can say this is the parietal pericardium again then there is this uh, visceral pericardium i will mark it only then there's a pericardial cavity then there's a pericardial fluid and all these things now we are actually concerned about this part that is the heart wall so this heart wall is actually made up of three layers how many three layers so the outer we call as epicardium then myocardium and endocardium okay you can see it here in the diagram that this part is the this part you can observe it here carefully that this is the endocardium this thickened area is we call as myocardium okay and then inner to it this layer is we call as epicardium the another name for epicardium please remember it here only it's we call as visceral pericardium okay so these are the three heart wall layers that are often asked and the very important fact about this thing is that in the myocardium we say it's the thickest heart wall and in myocardium we would be able to observe specified muscles that actually make the heart that we call as cardiac muscles what we have we say first that this would be the thickest layer and in this layer what we will say there would be cardiac muscles and this layer would be regulating it would be regulating rhythmic contraction of heart okay so if sometimes we are asked that in a sequence if we have arranged the, all the layers along with this outer covering so we will say in a sequence fibrous pericardium okay then parietal pericardium then visceral pericard sorry then peri uh, pericardial cavity you can also mention then we have visceral pericardium then we have myocardium then we have endocardium this we can remember in a sequence i will write it here only sometimes you are asked the order of all these layers so i will write it here the first layer would be fibrous pericardium i am writing in shorter words then the next would be parietal pericardium then it would be pericardial cavity then it would be visceral pericardium or we also call it as epicardium 
okay then it would be myocardium and then it would be endocardium i guess all these layers and all these coverings are quite clear to you even the diagram is also with the, uh, with in front of you you can observe all the things in a detail then we will move to the next part that is we call as now since we are well aware about these things that now how are the things when we see a heart you know uh, when we observe this heart what happens in our mind there observes like at the base this is muscular thing okay on the top there are blood vessels and all these things okay so sometimes we get a question about we do we are not asked about internal divisions we are asked about the external divisions if we observe a heart okay we will be able to clearly see that where are the auricles and where are the ventricles how the auricles are separated from the ventricles and how the ventricles are separated with each other okay so there are special divisions for it so let me assume this is the human heart we will take a little bit okay this is we used to call this region as base clear and this region we used to call as apex okay so if you look to this diagram are you observing this entire region entire region i am just shading it okay this entire region is actually demarcating it's differentiating this region there is a deep groove okay i can say that the base is getting separated with uh, with respect to apex or we can see the downward side with the help of a deep groove groove means a sulcus a deep sul sulcus a fissure so this deep groove you can observe it here i'm uh, drawing it in uh, with this reference so that things become very clear to you so if we say that this thing this is we call as the first jab hum externally heart ko dekhenge when we observe the heart externally then we would be able to see that there is a part there is a division that is bifurcating the upper side with respect to the lower side and this bifurcating structure is we call as coronary sulcus what we call it as coronary sulcus so this is the first part that is the coronary sulcus so on the top what we were having very good we were having auricles and on the lower side we were having ventricles so coronary sulcus is a part that is dividing auricles and ventricles auricles are differentiated from ventricles with the help of this coronary sulcus but it's the case of external appearance okay externally and even if we will see that there would be something like this also on the lower side we have ventricles okay and in between the ventricles we will see that the ventricles are also separated from each other and there is again a sulcus in between that is we call as interventricular sulcus sulcus so interventricular sulcus what it would do it will separate the left ventricle with the respect to the right ventricle okay so on the whole we said that this coronary sulcus is clear to you here and this one this i am marking it here because we cannot see the 3d image of this how human heart that's why i have shown it a little bit tilted side so this is the structure that we call as interventricular sulcus okay this is the interventricular sulcus this is the coronary sulcus again i repeat coronary sulcus is differentiating auricles and ventricles externally and interventricular uh, sulcus it's differentiating right ventricle and left ventricle externally clear now if we come to the internal structure we will not go in detail later on we will discuss all the things uh, related to it we say uh, that since we are discussing about septum that's why i have started this slide only so if we come to the internal structure okay so internally you will observe that we have a thing upper side that is some first getting something pouring it into here and on the upper side we have actually these chambers 
this is the part I am marking it here this part is we call as auricles what we call it as auricles so internally we say that the heart is divided into four chambers okay we say we have a complete four chambered heart why we have complete four chambered heart this is quite clear to us because we have to separate the oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood in order to avoid mixing of oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood the human heart is divided into four chambers and the four chambers are actually we call the top ones as auricles and the lower ones as so these are we call as auricles and these are we call as ventricles ventricles okay so auricles and ventricles and if you will see that these auricles and ventricles are further divided into this side we have we must be having left auricle left auricle and on the lower side we have left ventricle likewise we have here right auricle and on the low, lower side we have right ventricle okay right ventricle so now actually I'm here concerned about again the septum I was here I'm using the word septum and on internally and on the outer side we were using the term sulcus so internally if we will see that there are actually how many uh, septums there are basically this is the septum this is the first septum I am just making it a little bit more and larger so that it becomes visible to you the entire shaded region is the first septum that we will discuss this is the septum okay this is the septum you will observe that on the top I will mark it here these were auricles on the downside there were ventricles so the left auricle is separated from right auricle you will observe it here that the left auricle is separated from right auricle and here we have a septum we have a wall that we call as interauricular septum so the first septum that we will say that is interauricular septum interauricular septum is actually a septum that will divide right auricle with respect to left auricle okay then we have next septum it's actually only this septum the septum entire septum is divided into two parts the upper part this region we will call as interauricular septum and the lower side of this septum that is actually divided ventricles we can observe it here that these ventricles are separated and the part that is dividing them we will call them as interventricular septum so interventricular septum divides right ventricle to left ventricle so this is the first with this we have completed the first septum entire septum that is we call as interauricular septum and interventricular septum then if we will see that we have again a septum we have again a septum okay here it's quite clear because there are different openings attached to there that's why maybe it's becoming a little bit difficult so now these auricles and ventricles are again separated what is going to happen auricles are separated from ventricles let me mark it here only okay if this point is clear to you you can clearly understand that this is the interauricular septum this is the interventricular septum and now i am concerned about this septum okay this septum is actually what it's doing it's dividing auricles and ventricles auricles and ventricles okay so 
we have the first septum that we call as left AV septum. What is this AV? AV stands for auriculoventricular septum or sometimes we can also call it atrioventricular septum. So, the septum that is now dividing left auricle and left ventricle. We will call it as left AV septum and here this is next thing that is right AV septum. This is the left AV septum. This is the left AV septum and this is the right AV septum. So what is right AV septum doing? The same function as left one was doing. It's separating the right auricle with respect to the right ventricle. So internally the four chambers are separated by we can say four septums on the whole but actually these are two. So we can say the first as the interauricular septum, interventricular septum, left AV septum and right AV septum. Okay, now we have some of the things that are often asked that are quite important for the competition point of view. That is, what are the things that differentiate a fetal heart with respect to the adult heart? Okay, different things, two different things that are continuously asked in different competitive exams is that in the feet, if you observe a fetus, okay. The fetal heart has some of the structures that we are not able to observe clearly in case of a normal adult uh, person, okay. And these two structures that are actually differentiating the fetal heart with respect to the adult heart, these are the two things that we call as fossa ovalis and we call it as ductus arteriosus. Let's come to the diagram, we will understand it's quite a clear concept, okay. So in the fetus heart, if we will observe that, we have a septum that we call as, we just right now discussed it, we call it as interauricular septum. Interauricular septum, if I am saying it means that I am concerned about this septum. Okay. So there is this we call as interauricular septum. So what happens in case of fetus? There is a hole. There is a hole between the left auricle and a right auricle through which blood enters from left auricle and blood leaves from left auricle to the left. Blood exchange takes place. Okay. Please try to understand fossa ovalis. Fossa ovalis actually ovale or fossa ovale we can also call it as. Fossa ovale ovalis is actually a hole. It's a hole present in the left uh, present in the auriculoventricular interauricular septum. Okay, again I am repeating fossa ovalis is a hole, it is a hole present in the interauricular septum, especially of a fetal heart that allows exchange of blood. Okay, so just at the time of parturation, what happens? This fossa ovalis, this hole gets resealed or it gets plugged off. And then this fossa ovalis gets converted into fossa foramen. Now what is this fossa foramen? Means that if you will observe an adult heart, you will see that on the interauricular septum still there are some scars, there are some remnants we can say, remnants left left of what fossa ovalis means the hole has filled up but still some scars have left that scars we actually call as that scar we call as fossa foramen and this fossa foramen actually explains the primitive fossa ovalis in the fetal heart okay coming to the next thing you can also observe it here in the diagram the foramen ovale is given quite nicely you will see that it's connecting the right auricle with the left auricle and there is the exchange of blood 
सेकेंड स्ट्रक्चर दैट वी ऑफन आस्ट दैट इज डक्टस आर्टेरियोसिस इट्स अ कैरेक्टरिस्टिक फीचर ऑफ फीटल हार्ट सो वट इज एग्जैक्टली डक्टस आर्टेरियोसिस प्लीज वी कैन ऑब्जर्व इट हेयर दैट एक्चुअली इफ यू ऑब्जर्व दैट दिस रेड कलर थिंग इज दिस ब्लड वेसल द ग्रेटेस्ट ब्लड वेसल दैट वी कॉल एज आयोटा आई एम राइटिंग इट हेयर ऑल्सो आयोटा एंड दिस इज द डाउनवर्ड साइड वी कैन कॉल इट एज पलमोनरी ट्रंक द ब्लू लाइन इट्स एक्चुअली द पलमोनरी ट्रंक सो यू कैन ऑब्जर्व इट दैट दिस पॉइंट दिस पॉइंट if you clearly see that the pulmonary pulmonary trunk is getting linked to aorta the pulmonary trunk is getting linked to aorta in case of fetal heart and the linkage the structure that links up we call it as ductus arteriosus again i repeat so ductus arterio arteriosus is actually a structure that is connecting the pulmonary artery with respect to pulmonary trunk with respect to the ductus arteriosus so this is we call as the connection that we call as ductus arteriosus so after that this ductus arteriosus at the time of birth what happens just after birth this ductus arteriosus gets converted into then in the adult structure that we call as ligamentum arteriosus so conversion of ductus arteriosus into ligamentum arteriosus so this is the structure that is found in the adult showing a remnant of ductus arteriosus same ways fossa foramen is the remnant of fossa ovalis and these two parts are very important these are actually we can say they are often asked in the competitive point of uh, compete from the competitive point of view it's quite important and it has been asked repeated times okay so again i repeat fossa ovalis and ligament uh, ductus arteriosus they are present in the fetal heart and in the adult heart the fossa ovalis gets converted into fossa foramen it's actually the remnant of it and ductus arteriosus gets converted into ligamentum arteriosus that's it